Can you tell us where Jake Sisko is at the start of the novel? Yeah. <laughs> We've waited uh, actually, long Jake enough. Sisko, Jake Sisko's uh, uh, dealt with in book two by James Swallow. He's in The Ashes of Tomorrow, along with his wife. Uh, when we first catch up with him, he's living on Bajor. He's working on a new novel. Uh, he's you know receiving a certain amount of praise for the work he's done up to that point. And he gets visited by his father, who has come back from the temple many years prior and mm-hmm. basically his father says you've got to take your wife and your kid and get off this planet because i've had a vision from the prophets who are telling me this planet is not long uh, for this universe you need to get Ooh. out of here and go join oh. cassidy and uh rebecca you know your, your half sister you need to go join cassidy and rebecca on cestus three right now and there's a great sequence that james wrote where they're trying to get off world and of course, the transports are all you know clogged. It's all chaos. There's disorder. People are on the verge of rioting, and it's all about to go to hell. And the you know the authorities are about to probably start you know opening fire on civilians. And Jake Cisco basically stands up on top of a shuttle and leverages the fact that he is the son of the emissary, and he basically shouts everybody into order and gets the situation under control and gets himself and his family off the planet, but also saves thousands of lives from a, a riot that was probably going to go wrong. So he you know, has his moment of heroism before he, you know, as they say, gets on the bus and leaves the story. Holy crap. But he makes it out safely. And uh, <laughs> this is, so this cool. is a spoiler. Or this is a terrible <laughs> spoiler for the end of book two. Uh, <laughs> after he's on the ship, but before the ship can get out of the system, it is under threat from, these things called nagas, which are, we'll just call them giant space snakes, for lack of a better description. They are incredibly powerful, very destructive, and if they get a hold of your ship, they're just going to bite it in half or smash it into pieces on, the, on impact. His ship is threatened by this, and what eventually saves his and several other ships is a uh, sacrifice of a Starfleet vessel being commanded by Nog. Nog mm-hmm. basically gives his life and sacrifices his ship uh, to save Jake's family and to save thousands of other people. Wow! So it's a, a heroic there. tribute to Nog. <laughs> Nog becomes captain and oh. does the uh, the noble thing. Oh. Any inspiration from the uh, eighth season of? It's um, actually we came up with this before any of us had seen what you leave behind mm-hmm. uh, or what we left behind. We we hadn't seen that. We didn't know what their plans were about the eighth season, and by the time that came out we had already locked in on this story and we found it kind of interesting that there were these parallels uh obviously the timing is very different they have it like 25 years later uh whereas we're just a few years later uh, Hmm. maybe 10 years later uh but you know again the premise very similar yeah oh and actually melissa sorry melissa you've got the image behind you it's only a paper moon uh that david mack Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. had the writing credit on. Sorry, Sirach, what were you saying? No, I was going to say we owe David a check. Somebody owes you a check over there for that, <laughs> uh, what you left behind. Um, but I did yeah, have a question. A lot of the clips from a lot of my episodes in that one, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot um, of clips from uh, Starship Down, a lot of clips from uh, Paper Moon. Yeah. And uh, strangely, when I talked to, you know, Ira, and, you know, asked if you know, there was any way to get on camera and talk about it, he blew me off. Apparently, I wasn't important enough to talk to. So, well, I guess he'll regret freelancers that. don't count. <laughs> he'll regret that. <laughs> but You'll I have a question sorry, for you. Bear. <laughs> what is the storyline that you were most sad to put a close or like a ribbon on, and, and um, yeah, that you were you know were most upset to have to say goodbye to in the books. Uh, yeah, God, there's so many. I guess the one that I've been running is that uh, we had found a, or I had found a way to bring back data that I thought was uh, better than some of the others I'd seen done, say in comics or uh, elsewhere. I'd had this, you know, notion of how data comes back, and eventually, once uh, reincarnated, he finds a way to resurrect Law. So there was this new mm-hmm. relationship between. Uh-huh. Data and Law, and he doesn't choose to go back to Starfleet. He realizes, you know, I've given Starfleet enough of my first life. Mm. This is a new lease on life. I brought my daughter back. We're just going to live. We don't have to be part of Starfleet anymore. And so they had this interesting arc where they were doing interesting things and sort of just exploring life. And the idea that after what I went through and what the characters went through to bring Data back from the dead. 
uh, in a way that I felt was emotional and satisfying to have to see those characters go into the dark and to have that story effectively be erased uh, is kind of heartbreaking. In fact, the whole, to be honest, the whole trilogy, the whole undertaking, the whole remit of the project is heartbreaking. It was essentially, uh, gee, let's find a creative way to burn down 20 years of our own work and wow. 20 years of the work of dozens of our colleagues. Um, and, and there's just, there's no way to approach that that isn't heartbreaking. Especially since you are covering so the expansion of the stories of so many characters. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, there's so many characters that all splintered off, but also kind of stayed, mm-hmm. you know, weave back in and out. And there's, it's just so expansive and there's so much. I mean, we, we had finally, uh, you know, Riker and Troy, they have their kid. Uh, we had them have a daughter uh, after having dealt with miscarriages uh, in the mm-hmm. Destiny trilogy, which, you know, put them through some hell, which apparently they have not endured in the uh, Picard series. We had Picard and Beverly finally get married. And thanks to 24th century medical uh, technology and intervention, they were able to have a child together despite their years. So they had a young son named Rene, mm-hmm. um, who, un- who unfortunately goes through quite his own bit of hell in the uh, uh, Coda trilogy. And again, it's just, it's sad because we always felt that there was wasted opportunity there that really Picard and Beverly were meant for each other. There was some sort of star-crossed romance and that it was really just disappointing in many ways that the show producers chose not to pursue it. They seem to have gone out of their way to find reasons not to pursue it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So we kind of just said, well, let's go the other way. Uh, And Picard has an epiphany in the books after a certain point. And they get together and they have their kid and he's happy. And essentially he realizes that fatherhood made him a better man. It taught him new things about himself. It changed his perspective. It changed his way of thinking about other people, his way of thinking about time, his legacy. It made him more patient, made him more empathetic. And he realized that, becoming a father was you know something that he put off something that he thought he didn't want until he embraced it and he sort of almost had to be dragged into it but then once there he basically did it the way he does everything in his life with class and style and gusto Mm. and he becomes good at it and it makes him a better man and so that's another thing that's hard to let go of is we've put picard through this journey of growth and development, uh, you know, through his journey into fatherhood. And again, having to erase that uh, seems a shame, but it's, that's the job. We knew it was dangerous when we took it. (laughs) 